Aloha. Welcome to Departures to Alpha Centauri, sponsored by the United Galactic Federation of Planets. This is Ships, Part 2. My name is Merlin, and I'm your tour guide. This video is a combination of two live programs that were broadcast from Access Tucson on October 29th, 2011, and November 19th, 2011. The names of those programs were Who's On Board? And the second program was What's On Board? These two programs have been combined to make a 50-minute program instead of two 25-minute programs. And they both are involved with a program that was produced by Dr. Frank Stranges back in 1993. He was giving a lecture in Los Angeles, and in that lecture he read from the Dead Sea Scrolls. He read excerpts from the Bible that you will never find in the Bible. These were portions that have been deleted, and as you watch this program, you will understand why. The portions that should have been in the Bible, in the book of Ezekiel, the book of John, several other places, are so unbelievable that you might be able to understand why our forefathers decided to omit them from the Bible. But it tells us what's happening right now, today. This is so pertinent, so relevant to what's going on in our world that it's a, it's a shame that we haven't been able to read this in the Bible like we should have. But all through history, we've had groups of humans that have had agendas, and they take things out, but we needed to know. So with that, I invite you to continue watching and enjoy the next two live programs. On the first program, I have a guest host whose name is Carla, and she helps to explain some questions from callers. So please continue to watch, and aloha. Aloha. Welcome to Departures to Alpha Centauri. The name of our program tonight is Who's On Board? Our guest tonight is Carla. And Carla, why don't you tell us something about yourself? I'm Merlin's neighbor. More? Carla is very <laughs> enlightened. Shy. She has given me enormous amounts of information. And last, last program, our last live program, I told you about how the NSA, here's a picture of their facility in Maryland, declassified reports on extraterrestrial communications. Here is the top secret agency of our federal government coming out and saying that we are now in contact with extraterrestrials. Well, for the last 60 years, we've been told there is no such things. There's no flying saucers. There's no extraterrestrials. Project Blue Book debunked everything. Well, Carla was kind enough to find this information, and it tells us in this report that a very smart man back after World War II, whose name was Enrico Fermi, came up with the Fermi paradox. And in this paradox, he suggests that ETs may be widespread throughout the galaxy. Indeed, their civilizations could easily colonize the galaxy and form a galactic club among intelligent societies, a concept made popular uh, in, in Star Trek. And the name of that galactic club was the United Federation of Planets. And in his three scenarios of this paradox, the third scenario talks about a zoo hypothesis, zoo as Z-O-O, -O, and in that hypothesis, they talk about ETs intentionally being invisible. ETs have not made themselves visible, except occasionally, like saucers, but they have been watching us. And in a zoo hypothesis, ET treats the Earth like a wildlife preserve to be observed, but not fully incorporated into the Galactic Club. This was made popular through Star Trek as the prime directive for non-interference with a primitive culture. But under the zoo, zoo hypothesis, once uh, Earth reached certain, certain milestones, then we can be contacted. And one of those milestones is the discovery of light speed travel. 
that's where we are right now. We can actually travel faster than the speed of light. And according to Fermi and his third scenario, we're now to be made contact with. Well, in the last two live programs, that's what I've said over and over. We have ships that are arriving in this world and they're here to help. They're not enemies, they're our friends. And our program tonight is who's on board? Who's actually on board these ships? That's our, that's our main question. Well, we have a video we'd like to show you from a good friend of mine who unfortunately passed in November of 2008. His name is Dr. Frank Strangis. He, he was a uh, ordained minister in the Christian church. He built several churches. He had three PhDs. He was president of a university in California uh, by correspondence. And my wife and I used to attend his seminars in Las Vegas. Um, he's going to talk to you about the Dead Sea Scrolls. And as you can see by the sign behind us, this is the cover to his DVD. It's called Mysteries of the Dead Sea Scrolls. And in it, it talks about a modern conspiracy that actually started in ancient times. He's going to tell us about parts of the Bible that should be in the Bible. Um, excerpts from Ezekiel, Jeremiah, and John that are th parts that you've never heard before. So let's get started on this video and you'll see Doc describing in a speech from 18 years ago about portions of the Dead Sea Scrolls that should be in our Bible but are not. Here is Dr. Frank Stranges. Here's another one found in March 14, 1952. Speaking of Ezekiel's wheel, this is fantastic. He was 30 years old. His birth date was the 5th of July when this took place. Among religious exiles, if you remember, Ezekiel was part of the captivity right near a community at the river Chibar. And the name of the community was called Haru Kabari in Tel Aviv. He says, the hand of the Lord is upon me. And there's a little word that means revealed that follows the word me confirmed also by the Septuagint Syriac Arabic translations the Dead Sea Scrolls read the mighty arm of Elohim raised me up from the river Chebar and touched my tongue then mine eyes then my heart in the midst of a whirlwind caused by the wheel within another wheel, thus emanating from the north. The creatures were like angels. The beings looked like men. If you check your first chapter of Ezekiel, you'll find there are four points that are made quite clear. Man, lion, ox, and eagle. The Dead Sea Scrolls reveals that the man is the highest intelligence among God's creation. The lion speaks of the, of the majesty of God's creation. The ox speaks and testifies of the patience of serving Almighty God. And the eagle speaks of the swiftness in order to bring divine judgment to pass. The emotion in verse 12 is straightforward. Angels of God, messengers of God, do not deviate one direction or another. In verse 13 and 14, the coals of fire are symbolic of anointment from God as well as judgment and holiness. In verse 15 to 23, the wheel within the wheel represent the gyroscopic principle. The eyes mean windows, all-seeing, all-knowing eyes, round windows if you please. The noise of the wings are interpreted engines or motors. They let the wings down, which meant they let the wheels down before they touched down to the ground. In verse 29, the wheels did indeed touch the earth and fire subsided and the door of the outer chamber opened and the silver pathway was lowered by the angels. Listen to this. The angels looked at Ezekiel 
and beckoned him to come, to come close and to come closer, to place his feet on the silver pathway, the ramp that proceeded to join them, he together with the angels. Verse 31, then they sat down together and they broke bread and they drank and had fellowship together. Ezekiel was shown the future as God directed them. And as the angelic messengers spoke, the silver ramp, the silver pathway, which also came down, was brought back and the wheels were raised. In verse 33, Ezekiel revealed as he marveled at the wheel and the grandeur of seeing the earth fall beneath his feet. What does this mean to you? He went up in this ship. And furthermore, he says, among the marvels of the earth below, Ezekiel saw the grandeur of the sun and the moon and the stars such as he never saw before. Next verse, he wept aloud as the angels and messengers of the Lord lifted their voices and their hands and their eyes and offered praise unto the God of creation. The wheels departed from the earth high above that of the most powerful eagle. Ezekiel said, I saw and I witnessed and I understood the true meaning of the divine fellowship between man and those who have come from afar to help the sons and daughters of men. And the final verse, sleep overcame Ezekiel. And when he awoke, he found himself lying near the shore of the river Chebar. He witnessed and gazed upon the circle wherein the wheel had left its mark. I don't know how theologians are going to be able to treat that verse of scriptures. Here's another one. The Greek word twasso means to disturb or to stir up or to upset. I think that's what they think of us now. In the Aramaic language, you read, In my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. The King James 1611 version says, In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. The Dead Sea Scrolls look at it a little differently. The Dead Sea Scrolls says, Do not permit your pure mind or your hearts to become troubled in any form, but rather allow your faith and your belief to solely rest in Almighty God. You believe wholeheartedly in Almighty God, the Master speaking, you will also believe with all of your heart, mind, and spirit in me. In our universe, not in my father's house, in our universe, which I have created, there are multitudes of places and orbs which along with the earth shall be your future dwelling place. Stop for a moment. A lot of people in the religious world, they think that after they die, they're going to float around on a pink cloud strumming a harp. <laughs> You've heard that. Or a guitar or a whatever. Not so. If the master says, in my father's universe are many dwelling places, and he also says, there are a multitude of places. The next verse is, I have prepared many places for you to visit and also places for you to dwell in the future. In reality, because I am God, I shall be with you always, everywhere, and you will always find me accompanying you. And when the time is ripe, R-I-P-E, you shall know that I have already made a way for you to be transformed, and then you shall dwell with me in these other places. In that manner, you shall never be apart from me again. Surely I will be with you always. I have already made provision. So do not allow your pure mind nor your pure heart or your spirit to become disturbed. I am well aware 
that the evil one and his followers have already tried and tempted and attempted to try your faith. He is very busy, and his evil activity, activities shall increase in the time of the end. Listen to this. His own angels, whom I have cast out of the heavenlies, according to the book of Revelation, down to the planet Earth are busy attempting to, in every way, to destroy your faith. But you, my children, shall be assisted by my angels and my heavenly messengers, who will reveal themselves in chariots of fire. They will bring you a message that will not cause you to be encircled, that will cause you to be encircled with my holy flame of fire, that will cause much discomfort to the enemy. I bet it will. They shall also minister to you and protect you because I have assigned them to do so with the words of my mouth. I have spoken thus. Now I shall leave you but for a brief season. Meanwhile, my spirit shall accompany you on Sundays. <laughs> of course not. My spirit shall accompany you always. You will never be comfortless. Even so, I am with you always, even unto the time of the end. My love shall embrace you such as never before. I am the Lord that changes not, and I keep my word. You want to hear two more? Yes. All right. This one I like in John. This is from the Copper Scrolls in cave number three. You have not chosen me, for I have chosen you. My other children, not of this orb, there's that word again, O-R-B, have been anointed to perform certain tasks directly touching you. They are not to be worshipped, nor revered above that which you worship me. They have responsibilities and duties that as they perform solely because they love me. You are cautioned not to be overzealous in your communications with my angels. You are warned that they possess great powers with which they have been created. These powers shall be shared with you who are called by my name. Even so, I am the God who watches all and sees all. Always be mindful that you never walk alone. Even though you dwell among a sinful and perverse generation, let hidden inner eyes, the word your is missing. It just says, let hidden inner eyes be open to these truths that shall not be hidden from you. And this is the one that I received this past Friday. Again from the Copper Scroll, cave number three. This is about the temptation of Jesus Christ by Lucifer. This is a crack up. Lucifer is saying to the master, look at me to be your deliverer and your savior. If you find that you are too weak, lean on me. This is Lucifer speaking. And I will bear you up on eagle's wings when you fall down from the top of this mountain. If then you be the Christ that you claim, leap from this mountain top and prove to me that you are the great one, the master of the universe. The master Jesus said, you do not have the right nor the power to even tempt me to leap from this mountaintop. Nevertheless, you shall not succeed in tempting me. Then Lucifer said, Command then that these stones be turned into bread, because I discern that you are very hungry. Jesus answered and said, Even though I may be hungry, I would not seek relief from you. 
because you are a liar and a thief and a deceiver of my people. Depart from here, depart from my presence before I strike you from the living. It was at that moment that a bright light lit up the clouds and started to descend to the place where Jesus stood. The bright light then took him from the chariot, from the spot, into the chariot of fire. Jesus did walk upon the silver bridge and departed from the mountain within the belly of the chariot, which shone brighter than the sun. Lucifer then, forced to cover his eyes, did run into the blackness of the cave, high atop the mountain, lest he be consumed with the brightness of the chariot of fire that shone brighter than the noonday sun. These are the writings and the words of the beloved disciple whom Jesus loved and blessed. Who was that disciple? John. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't know what's going to happen in the near future when these revelations are made known to the world. But look with me in your mind's eye, if you will, way out in the plains of Qumran into the mountainous area, four caves uncovered, two caves still hidden. As the winds blow over the top of the sands of the desert, or if God speaks the word, causing a tremendous explosion to take place that will uncover those other two caves. What truths shall be revealed then? What will we learn that we have not heard today? What is your position in the universe? My friends, the master said over and over again, Almighty God even said, you are not alone. So my prayer is that your eyes will be open in this year and that your mind will be clear to feed on the truth of the word of the living God and that your spirits will soar high into that higher vibration, higher than you have ever enjoyed before. When you realize God loves us so much that he sent his space beings, heavenly messengers, heavenly angels, to assist you in every way possible. God loves us so much that he sent his space beings to assist us. Now, even if you don't believe in God, and this level, this program is a level one program, so we're not preaching God, but even though you've heard these messages about orbs beyond our world, about beings that have been sent to help us, do you now start to see what these ships may be all about? And as you can see on the bottom of the screen, we have phone numbers. And our chief engineer told me that there were two calls just before we went to the video. So those of you that did call in, please call again. Carla has graciously volunteered. Oh, there's a call right now. Look at that. Push. Aloha. Who's this? Hi. Um, I'm a first-time caller, actually. My friend just told me about the program. Oh, great. We're glad you're watching. So this whole talk is about aliens and such? Yes. Like, uh, have you uh, ever talked about stuff like the uh, theories of the Anunnaki and the scenarios and such? Carla, that's down your line. Tell us. That's why she's here. Oh. We've been having a lot of discussions about ancient cultures and how a lot of what is written down in the mythology is probably actually aliens. And the Sumerians um, had a lot of that in their uh, mythology and culture. Yeah, I just thought it was pretty cool and not too many people know about that. It is cool. So do you uh, know the books by Zechariah Sitchin at all, though? Or? No, I've, I've actually read uh, the Epic of Gilgamesh and a few other things. Oh, oh, I can't believe you actually finished the Epic of Gilgamesh. Yeah. <laughs> Have you tried, like, the Book of Enoch at all? Yeah, I read that when I was 12 in my grandmother's bedroom. <laughs> That's actually pretty crazy. Yeah. So how often is this show on? We're every third Saturday at 8.30. This is like the 12th show since last spring. 
But thank right, you for well, calling. I'll have to tune in next time. Please do. Thanks. All right. And nice anyone else? Me. Push the three button. Before we go off the air, we've only got two minutes left. I want to talk to you about two more th quick items. Uh, Doc talked about spacecraft, about saucers, wheel within wheels. Well, another very famous person in our history, Admiral Richard Byrd, experienced saucers. He flew inside the Earth back in 1946, and during that flight, he was intercepted by vehicles that caused his plane to pretty much lock up. He talks about, um, we were crossing over a small mountain range, and there was a, a green valley below us. We couldn't see any more ice and snow. Now, remember, he's flying inside our planet. He's going in through the North Pole. Um, he, uh, he says, um, we decreased altitude to 1,000 feet and saw a giant mammoth, a woolly mammoth. Uh, we're encountering rolling green hills now. My God, off to our port and starboard wings are a strange type of aircraft. They are closing rapidly alongside. They are disc-shaped and have a radiant quality to them. Uh, we are caught in an invisible vice grip of some, some type. Well, the radio crackles and a voice comes through in English which says, Welcome, Admiral, to our domain. We shall land you in exactly seven minutes. Well, here is one of our greatest explorers, Admiral Richard Byrd, and you can look this up on the Internet. It's, it's readily available, talking about saucers intercepting him as he enters the hollow earth inside of our planet. Well, he's talking about saucers. Doc is talking about saucers that were described in the Old Testament and the New Testament in the Dead Sea Scrolls. But we can't read that today because that's been taken out. That's why this is a conspiracy of ancient origin. So it makes you start to wonder. And the question of this, this program is, who's on board? Who's really on board these saucers? And it's for you to decide. We've run out of time. Thanks for listening. Aloha. 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 Welcome to Departures to Alpha Centauri. We are coming to you live tonight from XS Tucson here in Tucson, Arizona. The name of tonight's program is What's on Board? Now, the reason it's called that is because last time, our last live show, the question was, who's on board? And during that program, I showed you a clip from Dr. Frank Stranges. Dr. Frank was a very good friend of my wife's and mine. Unfortunately, he passed three years ago, last Thursday, but he was a brilliant man who was here to help. He was here to help mankind. And he produced videos about saucers and angels. Now this is a level one program. As you can see, I have on a Hawaiian shirt, so I'm not gonna talk about God. So anybody that might be offended by my talking about God, don't worry. We will talk about the Bible to some extent, but only as a historical document, not as a sacred text. And I would like to show you some more of Doc's lecture back in 1993. This was filmed from 18 years ago, and Doc talks about some of the people that have been on UFOs, on flying saucers. And as you can see behind me, we have a picture of one of the Victor ships. I'll tell you more about that after we see the clip. So at this point, we will listen to Dr. Frank Stranges as he talks about people from the Bible being on board flying saucers. My friends, do you realize that I'm going to be saying this quite a few times today, we are not alone in the universe. We never were, we never shall be. We have a multitude of those whom we can call brothers and sisters from space who have been commanded by Almighty God to come here to the planet Earth to assist you and me. How many of you believe that? Say aye. aye. Do you realize at the moment you're born, there are two angelic beings assigned to every man, woman, and child on this planet. And these angels are called guardian angels and ministering, ministering angels. I believe the day will come in the very near future when those of you who pursue a higher realm of spirituality that your eyes will be opened and my friends you will see with your own physical eyes your angels. Sometimes you have testified to me on the telephone or by letter or in person 
that you feel that there's someone of beautiful presence in the room with you. How many of you have felt such a presence? How many of you have felt the presence when you're driving your car? The speed limit, of course. <laughs> we can't help but feel their presence, but I believe the day is coming when you're going to be able to see them with your own physical eyes. Many of the early church fathers were also contacted and inspired by space beings. These include, believe it or not, Martin Luther. He was another renegade. They include Charles Wesley. His brother John Wesley was afraid that if he would tell of his meetings with space people that they would call him a fanatic. So he kept that out of the public eye. The Dead Sea Scrolls also reveal that the ancient prophets were anointed with holy oil directly from the planet Venus and from the planet Jupiter. Don't tell me that we are alone in the universe. We are not. I'm beginning to see why these fellows are frightened because of the revelations that are about to take place. The Dead Sea Scrolls also reveal that Noah's Ark was surrounded by a force field very similar to the Ring of Fire. That's why no harm came to the Ark. Another section of the scrolls reveals that Ezekiel's wheel and his vision was not actually a vision, but rather a trip in a flying object that he called the wheel within the wheel. I'm going to read you the actual scriptures very shortly. And this particular wheel in the middle of the wheel transported him to the planet Venus, And then on his way back, on Ezekiel's way back to this planet Earth, he was told that he'd been gone 30 days, when to him it only felt like 30 minutes. The Dead Sea Scrolls actually revealed that the prophet Daniel was substituted that night with the lions by a space person who walked into the lion's den spent the night while Daniel was on board a craft high above the planet Earth having a great time with the people on board. Daniel spent a night on board a ship high above the Earth while somebody else took his place in the lion's den. That is coming from what should have been in our Bible. But unfortunately, it's been taken out. The Bible has been in human hands for thousands of years, and every human group had an agenda, and they removed things that should be in there. But you will never read that in any Bible that you buy in a store today. But you will hear about it from the Dead Sea Scrolls. And luckily for us, Dr. Frank had access to all the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now, some of you may have heard that the Israelis have now released the Dead Sea Scrolls on the internet. The problem is they've only, re only released 40%. 60% of the Dead Sea Scrolls are still kept totally hidden. And Doc's life was threatened because of these videos that he produced. From 1993 to 1999, he produced three DVDs. And each time he made one, the Ministry of Antiquities in Israel said, <laughs> we will kill you if you make another one. Well, he was preparing to make a fourth DVD in 2008, and he died of blood poisoning on November 17th, 2008. Now, if your life has been threatened, if you have been told, if you do something, we will kill you, do you see a connection? But that's another story for another day. But Doc was truly a saint for our world. In fact, he was even more than just a saint. In regards to what he was talking about, Daniel went aboard a ship up in space. And let me show you what that ship looked like. Now this ship has some blue coloring on it and you can kind of make it out, but because of the chroma color screen behind me, you're also seeing some of the image from behind me as well. 
And if you focus on the center of this video, of this poster, you can see this in, enormous ship above our Earth. This is called the Starship, or as we like to call it, the Mothership. It's 14 miles long, 7 miles wide, and 7 miles high. All through history, we have had people from our world go up on board this ship. In fact, NASA knows about this ship. It got involved with the shuttle at one point, which will be the subject of another program. But it's an amazing ship. Doc has been on board, had been on board many times. He said it's like a city inside. You can imagine, if it's 14 miles long, seven wide, seven high, it's enormous. Now the poster behind me is of a Victor ship. And here's the rest of the view. You're seeing just the ship itself, the top part behind me in the photo. But in this poster, we can actually see a schematic of the inside of the ship over here. This shows the first level and the second level. Now the name of this program is What's Aboard? What's on board? In our last program, October 28th, I talked about who's on board. That was a question. In the other video that I showed you from Doc, he talked about all these different people going on board the ship, the ships. Jesus went on board a ship, Ezekiel, Daniel, and other people in our country have been on board. They won't talk about it, but they have. Well, this is what it looks like on board the ships. This is the first level of the ship, and as you can see by our list here, we have a control plant, which is number one in the center, then we have a control, a power plant, excuse me. Then we have a control room, a laboratory, which is number three. That's over in this area. Uh, lavatories, pool and rest area. There's a swimming pool. On board, a saucer. Can you imagine this? Now remember this ship is 300 feet across from this corner, from this side to this side. This pool is about maybe two-fifths the width of the ship. So it's over, well, it's about 100 feet long. And Doc said he's been inside that on in that pool many times. There's a steam room, there's a, a vapor room, uh, number seven is a, a mineral jet pool, number nine is a gym, they have a library, number ten. Um, the commander's quarters, uh, Commander Valiant Thor is the officer in charge of all these fleets of ships and his quarters are listed here as Vel's quarters. He has his own private steam room and vapor room. Then when Doc would stay on board the ship, he would stay in the guest quarters, which are listed as number 13, and the guests even had their own living room, number 12. There was an auditorium and a worship center, number 17. That's this whole area. And when you read Doc's book uh, that talks about the, uh, the ship and about Commander Valiant Thor, Doc's book is called Stranger at the Pentagon, you get a complete description of how life, li how life is lived on board the ship. And he says, every day on the ship, they would have a worship service at the beginning of the day, and all 200 of the ship's crew would go into the auditorium and worship center to start the day. This is uh, the first level, then, of the Victor ship. Here's the second level. And in this view, you see more of the power plant, which is number one. Then we have maintenance and service lockers, Number two, that's over uh, over on this side, uh, and also storage area. Number three, um, we've got kitchen and food service, and a cafeteria. Number five, then there's the officers' dining room, which is number six. And as you would expect with any organization that involves 200 people, you're going to have the enlisted folks, and you're going to have the officers. And in this case, we have an officers' dining room. Then they have gardens and food preparation. They actually grow their own food on board the ship. Um, a storage area in number eight, a supply room number nine, laboratory in number 10, and then vehicle storage in number 11. Now in Doc's book, once more, in Stranger at the Pentagon, he talks about when they would pick him up at the airport in Las Vegas and drive him out to Lake Mead to go on board the ship. The ship would be cloaked, it would be invisible and it would be right above the water next to the shore. And he said there'd be people in houseboats and motorboats speeding around just below the ship. And they would have no idea that this enormous ship, the size of two football fields, was directly above them. But when the car got out 
to the lake area, a ramp would open from the vehicle storage compartment and they would drive the car right up on board the ship. And then inside this vehicle storage compartment were the shuttlecraft because they also had uh, smaller ships that could carry one, two, five, ten or so people. Uh, and then the last item is cruise quarters, which is this entire area up here. These are all the rooms where the 200 crew members stayed. Um, there was an outer hallway that went around the outside. You can see these little ovals that represent the doors that go into the crew spaces. But Doc said um, the crew stayed in here. He said something else that was unique about the ship is that there were no corners. There were no sharp corners. Everything was rounded. Everything was um, curved. And he said when he went into his room, when he went into the guest quarters, the room was empty. But whenever he wanted something, like a table or a desk or a bed, all he had to do was think about it and it would appear. Amazing. <laughs> Plus he said the lighting came from the ceiling, but there weren't actually any lights. They just uh, emitted light from, from above. Four shows back in September, on September 17th, I told you guys that starting two days before the anniversary of 9-11, which was on a Sunday, on a Friday, on 9-9-2011, Victor ships started coming in. All these ships that I've just shown to you. And for the next seven days, 3,300 of these ships, the ones behind me, came in over Tucson. We had seven continuous days of monsoon. It was a monsoon on Friday, monsoon on Saturday, Sunday, Monday, and the weather forecasters on the TV stations were saying, this can't happen. Monsoon season ended, and yet we had seven consecutive days of monsoons, and every day we had hundreds of ships arrive. Well, the reason was they had to hide in clouds. If we were to see hundreds of these Victor ships coming in over Tucson, everybody would freak out. So on that first program that I did back on September 17th, I talked to you guys about Independence Day. We used a video clip, and in the movie Independence Day, there are spaceships arriving in clouds. Then, three weeks after that, I did another program in October, on October 8th, and in that program, we used ex uh, videos from Close Encounters of the Third Kind, and once again showed you guys clouds and ships arriving in clouds. In fact, the name of that program was life imitating art. In other words, the real thing was happening. The, the ships were coming in clouds. And after those first seven days in September, when the smaller ships arrived, then larger ships started coming in. Uh, two mile wide ships, 10 mile wide ships, 50 mile wide, 200 mile wide, and 500 mile wide ships. We had 500 mile wide ships arrive on October 6th. If you watch that of the program about life imitating art, you'll understand. And that's what's causing our weird weather. We went from summer to winter in the blink of an eye. On October 6th, the day started out in the 90s here in Tucson. By that afternoon, the temperatures had dropped 30 degrees. We were down in the 60s and 70s, and that night it froze and we had snow on Mount Lemmon. Plus they had snowstorms in Denver and New York City. New York has had a series of snowstorms in which the trees are being destroyed. They were still in summer. The leaves were still on the trees. And these huge snowstorms hit, and the trees got loaded up with snow, and the limbs broke off. Half of the trees in Central Park have been destroyed because of all this snow. Well, it's because of all these enormous ships that came in. And when they come in, they block the sunlight, and it gets cold. We are in for the coldest winter in the history of the world this winter. It's because of the presence of all these ships. Well. Why are all these ships here? What are they here for? Well, if you recall, the name of this program is Departures to Alpha Centauri, as you can see on the bottom. But our sponsor is the United Galactic Federation of Planets. There is an entire world of planets out there, and they're just waiting for us to join them. They can't wait. They're delighted that we're going to be part of their world. And they're sending in ships. The ships are going to transport us from our world to Alpha Centauri.
departures to Alpha Centauri. Now, if all these ships have been coming in, then you would suspect that maybe they have been seen. Maybe people are actually starting to see ships. Okay, this is from YouTube. October 29th, Tucson, Arizona, UFO, orb, flying over the Catalina Mountains, north side of our valley. But here's Scottsdale, Arizona, just north of us. We had UFOs. Now, remember, these are the titles coming off YouTube. But if you go on YouTube, you can watch these videos of these, of these saucers that have been filmed. UFO over Fresno, California, October 22nd, 2011. Pomona, California, October 26th, 2011. Now, notice there aren't just one or two UFOs. There are multiple UFOs in each case. Now, as we move east across the country, here's UFOs sighted in Missouri. 80-plus sightings reported in October. Now, these sightings are all coming from September and October. I haven't even printed out November yet. Here's Chicago. They had uh, UFOs. New York City on October 6th, even more. That was a, that was a group of three of them. Uh, here's sightings over Brooklyn, New York, on October 20th, UFOs in the sky. Here's a jet flying over Georgia that nearly smashed into one back on October 7th. Well, this fits the time frame. This is when all these ships are coming in. Here's Boca Raton, Florida, October 6th. More UFOs sighted. Here's a fleet of UFOs over Mexico on October 23rd, 2011. Well, yeah, we had 3,300 Victor ships, this size ship, come in for those seven days in, in September. So that gave us thousands of ships in September, and then even more hundreds of ships came in after that. So that's why we would have thousands of ships over Mexico. Um, that was over Guadalajara. Here's uh, Veracruz, Mexico, October 28th. More ships. Um, a blue UFO over Chile on October 21st. Now you guys can look up all of these on the internet. You can see all this yourself to, to, to convince yourselves. Here's uh, Tome, Chile on the 30th of October. Ontario, Canada. Another one of our neighbors. September 27th, UFOs. The sightings are just going through the roof. They have never had so many sightings of UFOs. Here's uh, September over Germany. Uh, we've got UFOs over Italy and Greece. This one was taken from a ship. This one's real interesting. You get to see the, sh uh, the, the UFO move right across the front of the ship. I guess this is a guy's wife, and they're on a honeymoon probably. Uh, October 8th in Jerusalem. Moscow on September 23rd. UFOs up in the sky. And you got to figure, people are going to a lot of trouble to film these things, and especially to post them on YouTube, because it's not easy. So a lot of people are out there, and they're seeing stuff. Here's Beijing, China, UFOs on September 14th. <clears throat> Manila, the Philippines, on both September and October. Here's a pilot in a fighter jet. He's actually got a, a cockpit camera. And in the video, you watch him look to his left, and then you watch the video, you watch the UFO fly right behind him, and then he turns around and looks to his right as it goes by. His camera, his cockpit camera filmed that. Here's a picture of a UFO taken from an airliner. Here's an engine out on a wing, and there's a UFO moving right across the bottom of the screen. And then lastly, <laughs> here's NASA's version. NASA shows a UFR, UFO armada above Earth. We have UFOs like you would not believe. They are here. They are our friends. They're here to help. Now, lastly, I'd like to show you folks my wife and Dr. Frank. This was our first seminar with Doc back in November of 2005. You've seen Doc in the videos over here. This is my wife, Moana. I've talked to you previously in shows about her being a great, 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 great granddaughter of the first king of Hawaii, King Kamehameha, and she is also listed in the book of Revelation, she and her family. So I appreciate you guys listening. We're down to our last 30 seconds. No phone calls tonight. I would have 
gladly answered any questions. But we're at a point now where our rescuers are here. We are going to be saved from ourselves. We have to evacuate this planet, and the ships are here. It's happening. Everything Doc told you in his videos, everything I've been telling you for the last 10 months is happening, and it's good news. So we're down to our last seven seconds. I'd like to thank you all for watching. Watch us again in December, on December 10th, I believe. And I'd like to wish you all aloha and ahui ho. Until next time.